and he could see that there was something under the pallet. It was covered, I mean, there's something laying on the pallet and covered with a big tarp. And he could see part of what was under the tarp sticking out. And, and, and he saw a foot, and he saw, I think he saw a hand, and he saw part of the head of what turned out to be a giant humanoid. Giant humanoid. Giant humanoid. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Welcome back to Blurry Creatures. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. We have another great episode with Timothy Albarino today. Uh, you were on a couple episodes ago, and you talked about your new book, Birthright. But today, we really wanted to get into the topic of giants, which is something that's been a recurring theme on our show. We want to talk specifically about some things that you mentioned in the last uh, our last interview, which was there's this story of this giant that was killed in the caves of Afghanistan by U.S. military. And you interviewed the pilot who supposedly flew this beast out of the mountains of Afghanistan. We thought you'd bring bring you back on today, talk about that, and talk about the ancient giants, and keep the conversation going. So can you tell us a little bit more about this story of this pilot that flew this giant out of the mountains of Afghanistan? Yes, Steve Quayle and I, um, when we were doing the True Legends episode two, The Unholy Sea, we interviewed the pilot and you can see in the, in the, I believe the, the documentary opens with this interview and uh, we, we, we shot him in silhouette. Um, but he showed us his credentials. He was a really, really interesting guy. how do you, how do you track that guy down? Yeah. I think he, I believe if I remember the story correctly, he got in contact with Steve I think he heard Steve on the Hagman program. I can't remember exactly how he got in contact with Steve. Uh, but we, we interviewed him for the documentary and um, we got to spend some time with him. Uh, really nice guy, really credible guy in my estimation. <clears throat> Again, he showed us his credentials and he was active duty. He was active duty AC-130 pilot. And the story goes, let me see if I can re recall this accurately. During the uh, Iraq war, uh, he was deployed. He would, he would always fly in and, and to different bases and pick up cargo. That was his job and, and move, move cargo around. Sometimes he would, he would fly in and pick up different kinds of military assets, you know, people, special forces teams, or he would pick up. Uh, I remember he told me that he would fly in to pick up the bad guys. You know, they'd be all, uh, uh, they'd be handcuffed and, and with bags over their heads and he'd fly in and, and pick those guys up sometimes. And so, so he was, he was, he would he would fly in and out. Uh, I'm trying to think of the terminology he used, the the uh, military terminology he used. Um, high value uh, assets, kind of top secret type stuff. And when he would fly into a mission like that, uh, they would tell him before he got off the plane. They would tell him, look, this is a this is a I forget the terminology, classified or something. And so that mean that meant to him no pictures, no cameras. Uh, he wasn't supposed to ask any questions. He was just supposed to come out, pick up the asset and then go complete the mission and drop it off. And so one day he was flying into Bagram. I think it's called Bagram Air Force Base, if I remember right. We need our Rogan fact checker. <laughs> <laughs> I have to pull up the documentary or, or my script or the script for the documentary. And, but he flew into the base on a routine mission. And when he landed, they said, you're, you're picking up a high-valued asset here. It's confidential. 
uh, no pictures, no cameras, no questions, something to that effect. And so he lowered down the, the loading door on the, on the craft and, and walked outside the, to go see what it was that he was loading up on the, on the AC-130. And he was met by, he described them as, they look like intelligence officers, like Army intelligence or Air Force intelligence or something. Right away, he knew that whatever he was picking up was top secret. Hmm. And they told him, when, they, when, he, when he encountered them, they told him, they reiterated no pictures, no questions. And they walked him over to the, to the hangar. There was a, a large, there was a large pallet on the ground and and he could see that there was something under the pallet. It was covered. I mean, there's something laying on the pallet and covered with a big tarp. And he could see part of what was under the tarp sticking out. And, and, and he saw a foot and he saw, I think he saw a hand and he saw part of the head of what turned out to be a giant humanoid. And I remember him describing the skin as sort of pale grayish, which may be because the entity was dead at this point. And it had red hair. He described it had red hair and it had, he remembers six toes and, and six fingers. And, he, and, and what he really described with, with great detail, what was very vivid in his recollection was the stench. Hmm. He said this thing reeked. And, and, they, and the guy standing around the, the, this dead giant, again, covered with a tarp, uh, started to to tell him what it was and and what the rumor was about it and apparently this giant was killed in a cave i don't remember exactly where could have been kandahar i don't remember exactly if it even corresponded with with la's with the giant that la was told about i think steve steve and i determined that it was a different giant it was a different uh, incident that that uh, la's a contact described but but i don't remember how that shook out i can't remember um, but this, the pilot told us that he was told that I believe it was the Marines who encountered this giant. I, I, I want to say it was Marines, a group of Marines who were patrolling, doing a routine patrol around a village in Afghanistan. And they noticed that, I remember him telling us that they noticed that the local villagers were leaving, were bringing food and other items into a cave and leaving it at the mouth of the cave. And it was sort of an act of reverence to, to something or someone that was in the cave. And so, of course, the, the, the Marines, let's just say they were Marines, the Marines thought that, that they're uh, aiding and abetting the, the Taliban, right. that, they're, mm. that they're supplying the Taliban in the cave. And so the Marines decided to go in and, and smoke them out. And they went in there thinking they were going to encounter a bunch of Taliban guys, you know, and have a firefight. And when they went into the cave... What they encountered instead was this 15-foot giant. Wow. And they describe him as, they, they smelled him, if I remember right, first. And then he came out of the shadows and obviously frightened them. And if I remember correctly, because I, I, sometimes I get the two stories confused, L.A. story and, and ours. The giant killed one or two of the guys before they brought it down. And eventually they brought it down. They, they, you know, they put a, they put a whole lot of rounds into this giant. So, uh, and then the giant was airlifted out. They brought a helicopter in and they lifted him out to the base. And then of course they called in this AC-130 pilot to come and pick him up. And when you're interviewing these people, is there any moment where you're like, any of your red flags go off? Like this is all made up. I mean, are you just going purely on your senses that this guy's telling the truth? Well, the first thing I do is evaluate the person and, uh, you always want to see credentials and he showed us his credentials. He's active duty AC-130 pilot. He wanted to be, <clears throat> he wanted to, his voice to be masked and he wanted to be filmed in silhouette. Hmm. And that's a good sign. He's not looking for fame, not looking for money. Yeah. Nobody will, even knows who he is. So, so that was a good sign. And then, you know, having just shot the breeze with the guy for a while before we did the interview, I, I had a sense that the guy was telling the truth. He told me some other things too relevant to some other topics. And I had a good sense about him. I, 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 I believe his story to be true. Now, the only way you could ever verify it would be if he had physical evidence, you know, or, or photos that could be verified or something. Um, so in, in as much as we could believe him, Steve and I believed him. I, I found him to be very, very credible. We wouldn't have put him in the film if we didn't think he was credible. Yeah. And so uh, long story short, he, he, he picked up 
he loaded the body under the AC-130 and flew it to a base, I believe in Germany, or no, uh, Qatar. He flew it to Qatar. And from Qatar, it made its way to the United States. He, he learned later. And he heard, he said through the grapevine, he heard that the ultimate destination of this corpse, of this 15 foot tall humanoid giant, the ultimate destination was Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Hmm. And then that, you know, that was the end of it. That was the end of his, of his tale. And later on, by the way, let me say this. I almost forgot to say this. And, and Steve will attest to this, Steve Quayle. The pilot that we interviewed purposely withheld some details about his experience. And he told us that he did. He did that. He said, I'm not going to tell you guys there's specific details I'm going to withhold. And the reason he did that was so that if somebody else comes out talking about this incident, he would be able to confirm if those people uh, were telling the truth. Yeah, it's like the police. I mean, like, like when, when they're, they let so much out to the public, but they know things that only, that there are things that only the murderer or, or perpetrator would know, right? The same, yeah. I, it's the same way to fact check somebody. So they just exactly. didn't, hear it in the, didn't hear it in the news, didn't watch your film, didn't listen to LA, that it's legit. Yes. And so he called Steve. And after, after LA had come out with his, I, I believe it was, he did an interview or he certainly put it in one of his films and the AC-130 pilot got in contact with us and he was very excited. And he said, this guy's legit. Hmm. He's telling the truth. He describes some of the details that I purposely withheld. He was very excited about it. So that led us to believe that either LA's giant was the same story or it was another one of the same species in the general vicinity wow so it was a second giant how long do you think the giants lived did they live longer than human beings you think who knows one thing is clear is that they were they were living underground and that's why i think they had pale skin yeah i think the pale skin was natural it wasn't just because post-mortem it was it was the natural color of their skin and i think they're living under the ground these are cave dwelling entities that have been forced into the caves by human beings. And, you know, when you, in the United States, for example, the Native Americans have tales of hunting the giants because the giants were evil. The giants, they, were, they feared them and the giants were man eaters. And so they hunted them. Yeah, yellow hair. We, we talked about that in one of our early episodes, Nate. Yeah. yeah just like they hunted the, the, some of the wild animals and, the, and, and, and some of the, the megafauna back in the prehistoric times, they hunted the giants. And so they say, well, my thought is if, they, if they're underground, I mean, they must be living a long time if they can't, unless they can breed somehow or, you know. Well, how who knows how, how vast, how extensive those underground cave systems are. Yeah. And where they go. And maybe it's not all that bad under the ground. So, th- yeah, this gives me tons of questions, Tim. I, like I, so, in, in the entire narrative, we talk about the beginning of the Giants and the Watchers and the Nephilim and that whole, that whole process. And then we have the Flood and... You have the, the two the two different theories, which is there's survivors or there's you know the the bloodlines carried on through one of Noah's sons' wives, and then we get to you know to modern day and there now we have stories about giants that still exist, and so how are they still existing? Are, do you think these are like Bigfoot, where people some people hypothesize that these that these might be like interdimensional or I just I want to know I don't, where I don't subscribe to inner to the interdimensional hypothesis as it relates to giants or as it relates to aliens by the way because nobody understands what interdimensional means none of us have ever seen an extra dimension we have no idea what we're talking about it's mumbo jumbo um, we can kind of understand the concept of something being interdimensional but it's just a magic wand that we can wave at any problem and say you know oh I understand what's going on it's interdimensional Sure. When really, we don't have any freaking idea what interdimensional is. We don't. You can read Michio, one of Michio Kaku's books and get a scientific perspective on, on what interdimensional may mean. But outside of that, it's like trying to describe a color that, 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 doesn't, that we've never seen. So I, I try and stick with practical solutions that, that we can contemplate and that make sense within the world that we are familiar with. So here's a question. I mean, you, you brought up Bigfoot. We're talking about giants it, somehow existing and still being alive on the earth in caves well what about bigfoot yeah i mean are we to are we are, are we to suppose that bigfoot was on was on noah's ark I, I think they all went underground that's how i think they all survived yes so so there's a few 
options here. I mean, there's, there's actually a lot. There's a lot of possibilities. They could have gone under the, underground. If you're talking about an advanced entity, it could have gone off planet, which is doubtful. But if you're, it depends on what you're talking about there. They could have been in a portion of the earth that was not completely submerged. I am of the persuasion that the flood of Noah was global. But having said that, is it possible that there were certain places that were not submerged? I guess it's possible. Anything's possible. And then you've got some people who believe that the flood of Noah was local. I think, I believe, you know, that some of the uh, popular Christian Bible uh, scholars uh, like Mike Heiser believe that the flood of Noah um, he may or may not, I, I don't recall if he does it or not, but certainly very respected scholars believe that the flood of Noah was not, in fact, global. It was local. That's possible. I can't rule that out. I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I tend to think it was global. I think it was because you, you see it in the Americas, too. You know what I mean? You see it all over the Grand Canyon. You see it yes. through the New Mexico desert. Yes, there could have been multiple floods. There could have been uh, uh, floods all over the earth, but not over the entire earth. So there could have been flooding. By the way, when you talk about the flood of Noah, you have to, you have to answer the question in your mind that, that will give you clarity about the flood. Where did all the water come from? There, there's an old hypothesis that a lot of people used to subscribe to. I think most people have abandoned that ship, though, regarding a, a canopy, a canopy. Thank you. An ice canopy around the earth that melted. But you don't have to go that far. Stay on the earth. It's just stay, stay terrestrial when you think about this. All you have to realize is that there was an ice age. Much of the northern hemisphere, when you got close to the poles, and much of the southern hemisphere, close to the pole was frozen, solid, with a whole lot of water, and frozen in the form of ice. And most of North America was covered in ice. And so you had a sliver, and it was a, it was a wide sliver, but you had, this, you had this band, an inhabitable band around the earth. Hmm. Uh, and the temperatures would have been pr- pretty, pretty mild within that band. It, it wouldn't have been so variegated as it is today because you have, you have the, the caps are frozen. So again, not just the caps, uh, most of North America is frozen, right? So, so if there was an impact, let's say a comet, a cataclysmic event that suddenly melted that ice, you would have a global flood. Now, would the flood be, it would be global in nature for sure, because you're talking about a whole lot of water dumping, in the ocean all the, dumping into the ocean all of a sudden. And also, you're not just talking about a flood, you're talking about all kinds of cataclysmic uh, events happening simultaneously, lots of volcanism, vol- volcanoes going off left and right, massive earthquakes, tidal waves, every kind of cataclysmic geological event you could imagine was w- would have happened. It would have been a mass extinction event. And those those poles would have melted very quickly if the atmosphere heated up, and it would have amounted to essentially a global flood. Most parts of the Earth would have experienced massive flooding. I've heard some people say that there was water underground, and then it there was like plates that like collapsed and it just shot the well, water that's, out. That's that probably happened as well. Yeah, it, it, it probably was a combination of all these things. And then the water receded slowly. Would it take a year? For the water to, to recede? Well, the poles re- refroze. And, and so that sucked up a lot of the water. What about the greenhouse effect that I've heard? Would like someone say there was a canopy, like a greenhouse around the water was trapped in the atmosphere? Uh, that's possible. The, the atmosphere was certainly different back in the Ice Age. I mean, if Jesus can you know, take a couple loaves of bread and some fish and make it a huge meal, I'm sure he can make it rain for... <laughs> you know, 40, uh, 40 days, right? Uh, it's making it rain. Yeah. Yeah. But, and he certainly could. I mean, you know, Jesus is, I, I, in my book, I refer to him as the singularity. He is the source of all creation. He could certainly do whatever he wants. However, the universe and the natural world in our lives are not encompassed by regularly occurring supernatural events. We, we live in terms of the occurrences that happen in our lives they are pretty mundane and, and in the world in general, uh, it's like a clock. It's like, it's like the universe is ticking away and things are happening that were pre-planned, pre-ordained based on geological phenomena, astrological phenomena that was set in motion 
from the beginning. I don't know if I'm, if you understand what, what I'm saying. So yeah, rather than just, you know, God snapping his fingers and making it rain, it's, it's more likely in my mind that it would have occur- occurred like most things occur in life, that it would have been a preordained event, a comet or something headed for the earth that happened to hit the earth right at that moment in time, precisely uh, when uh, the earth was full of violence and corruption, because of course God is, is omnipotent, all knowing, and would have known the hour in which he was going to set the, fl- the, the flood beforehand. So in this course, that, that hurdles us down a theological road there. But, yeah. but the point is that there are many scenarios in which things could have survived the flood. Now, could people have survived the flood? Could human beings have survived a global flood that maybe didn't submerge all of the earth? I think the answer to that question is no, because the climactic change would have been so dramatic that it would have been impossible to survive. It would have been impossible. You couldn't, I mean, it, it, it would have literally been impossible to survive. Everything would have been different. Uh, suddenly, for those people who are alive, they would just would not have had the wherewithal to survive that level of cataclysm. However, could a Bigfoot type creature survive? Yeah. A creature that's more feral a creature that lives in the wild and that had the capacity, maybe, I think they do evidently with their, because their eyes are black, to live under the ground. Could they have just retreated into the inner earth? Yeah. And, 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 and the giants, you know, do the same. Could that have happened? And, it, and I guess, is it possible that some humans could have done it too? I guess that's possible as well. But, you know, the, the fact is that, that, and I say this as a fact, and I'm sure you guys probably would agree with me, I think it's. I think that the existence of of the Sasquatch is a fact. I think it's a stone cold fact. I love that. <laughs> there you go. There you go, everyone. Just like That's the it. existence of giants. I'm not yeah. talking about 20 foot giants. I'm talking about 15, 12, 13, 15 foot giants. In my mind, is a stone cold fact. Even today, very rare, but they exist still to this day. If that's the case, and we're talking, to, we're talking to nature as, you know, the laws of nature exist and like you're speaking about, and, and there's, there's these ways that, that things happen as they're supposed to happen because there's order, then is there like a breeding population of giants then? Probably. I, I just, that's always wondered, like, because, you know, you have these, you have the spirit father, earthly mother, and you get a giant. Are, then there, are there lady giants then too? Yeah, let's, let's just right away eliminate magic. So that's the first step in, I, I think, rational thinking is we eliminate magic. Magic is not a possibility. So, and when I say magic, by the way, I mean, that encompasses the term supernatural. Like feeding the 5,000. Well, that's on a different level. You're talking about the maker. You're talking about the son of God. Okay. That's a different okay. thing. Mir- miraculous, right? Yeah. So, so obviously God intervenes whenever he wants and does whatever he wants to do. Those are rare occasions. And we all have to admit that those are rare occasions. So, and even historically speaking, those are rare occasions. Um, and a lot of that was done to confirm the person of Christ. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the prophecies and things in the Old Testament and the things that were done were, were done to confirm Christ also. That's another discussion. So uh, when we rule out some of the more fantastical possibilities, we're left with much more pragmatic situations like breeding. Do the giants breed? Well, they have to breed. How else do they persist in the earth if they don't breed? I don't think giants live for thousands and thousands of years. They probably have a longer lifespan than we do. And I don't have any definitive reason I can tell you for that. It's just a, it's a hunch. It's just my suspicion that they live longer than we do. The Bigfoots may live longer than we do as well, uh, but they have to breed. Right. Just, just like they have to breed. Yeah. There isn't like a giant factory, you know, like uh, pumping out giants. <laughs> and that's why I said eliminate the magic because it's too easy to say, well, they're supernatural. Right. That's too easy. I don't play that game. I'm just that's like, too easy. I know the lady giants don't get any pub. We just never hear about them. We hear about Goliath and his brothers. <laughs> and Well, Patty, you know, the most famous Bigfoot, she's a girl. They must have, they must have females. They must have I mean, females. well, the other theory too, though, is that there's a ruling class in, in the ancient world. A lot of these giants then, you know, then – had offspring with regular women so yes so so yeah i mean you can you can you can breed through the human line intermixing the the, the giant uh, offspring with and people say well how does that happen if they're giants how do they have, copulate with a woman well they just do it instead of doing it when they're 20 they do it when they're 13 you know there's lots of different uh, options it's you know uh, it's again you just gotta think really really pragmatic yeah. prag- 
practically about these things. And, and there's an abundance of options. And I don't know which one is the case, but I would guess, I would assume that there's female giants and that they, they copulate, they procreate offspring. And just like, again, just like, the, I think the Bigfoot creature is a great comparison. They're out there. They exist. They breed. Mm -hmm. They produce offspring. There isn't a Bigfoot factory. They don't live forever. They do what all, the rest of us do on planet Earth. They, they have to breed and reproduce. And so I would guess that the, the giants have to do the same thing. So now I don't believe that there's a whole lot of giants out there. Yeah. Just like I don't believe that there's a whole lot of Bigfoots out there. I think they're far and few between. Well, there was, you know, obviously, and then they they were destroyed. See, I, I've kind of formulated a, an opinion and a thought that the Earth had a lot of water in the atmosphere because you find all these hidden megalithic cities like off the coast of California, right near uh, Catalina Island. There's some megalithic structures. There's megalithic structures on in Japan mm -hmm. underwater. And Atlantis was supposedly covered in water. So what if the Earth... At one point, most of the water's in the atmosphere, because and that produces the megafauna, and everything's bigger, and then it all comes down and buries all these ancient these ancient cities. Uh, that would that could supply some of the water, but it could not supply all of the water. You, I mean, you're talking about a tremendous amount of water. And then it, yeah. Well, let's comes, assume that the flood covered uh, Mount Everest. I mean, we are talking about a an, an almost an unimaginable amount of water. Mm. And just water in the atmosphere would not cut it. Now, I do believe that the atmosphere was moister and much more oxygen rich. You had to have, you had to have that for the megafauna. Well, you could have water, but doesn't it say in the Bible the com water came from below and, and above? I, well, I, I want to say that. Rain but it I, came up from the ground, right? Yeah, in the book of Genesis, it says that the earth was watered with the, with the dew. But you could have very well. You could have. You could have. It's very possible that there were these large aquifers under the ground, these underground uh, oceans like we know exist on some of the planets. There's veritable o oceans under the surface. There are probably was a lot more water under the earth. It could have been like an ocean of water under the earth before the flood. And because of the cataclysm, it, it, it ruptured and came and came out. Came, came spewing out of the ground, cracking open the earth, which would have accounted for a lot of the water. You have a lot of rain, you have water coming up from under the ground, and you have the ice caps melting. I think uh, that that would account for a global flood. I mean, do you think, you think that, uh, I mean, because at uh, the beginning of Genesis, we talk about how the earth was formless and, and the spirit of God hovered over the water. So was it that the water was just essentially pulled? To the to the pole to the poles and and the light. Well, that's what happens, you know, when when water freezes. So if you imagine, let's say, you imagine the Earth with no ice at the at the at the poles. There's no ice at the poles. Obviously, all of our coasts would be obliterated because there'd be a lot more water in the ocean then. So then imagine the temperature of the Earth dropping dramatically, and and at the poles where it's the coldest, forming ice. And so it's almost like the ice is grabbing the water and pulling it back and freezing it. Mm -hmm. And so and so it's like ice is it's storing up a lot of water at yeah. the poles. And if those poles melt, then you get a lot more water in the oceans. And of course, this is the this is the concern of uh, of global warming, which which I certainly don't subscribe to the the man made man made climate change. Although climate change is just a fact of life on planet Earth, dramatic climate change happens over well, we've had ice ages. the I eons. Mean, it's like a look at it. it cools and warms and cools and warms. You don't get an ice age without it cooling. Yeah, it's a cycle. It's, it's the Earth's position in, in, in the orbit around the sun. There is there is some kind of a configuration, an astronomical configuration with the Earth and the sun and possibly some other planets or some other kind of cosmological phenomena that causes the melting of the poles and then the refreezing of the poles. And, and I don't mean refreezing like they are today. I'm talking about an ice age. I'm talking about when I, say, when I say freezing of the poles, I should be more clear. I mean an ice age. I mean not just the poles. You know, where I'm sitting in Montana would be a big, huge sheet of ice. Yeah. I, I'm talking about most of North America frozen. You know, and so is this cyclic? Has the earth been going through this for millions of years? I think so. I think it's like a clock. And so you get, you get these dramatic climate change events and ice ages that are recurrent on the earth, on the planet. And so was that part of what happened? Was that part of the equation of the Noahic flood? I think it was. 
Yeah, it makes sense to me if that happens and if you think about the world as kind of like previously like a greenhouse and then someone takes the plastic off the top, suddenly only certain plants in certain areas are going to survive and the other ones are going to freeze on the on the on the on the edges, right? Or or if there's a, an asteroid or a comet strike, sure. that kicks up a lot of dust and lots of volcanism going on in the earth, you get all this soot in the atmosphere, volcanic ash and and and, and just soot and it blocks out the sun. And so what, what would happen in that scenario is you would get dramatically colder temperatures on the earth. There's, there's a lot of different, like I said, there's a lot of different possibilities. What about events like Sodom and Gomorrah, where are they trying to make giants again? I'm not sure that Sodom and Gomorrah had anything to do with giants. Judgment, right? Well, they're doing something. They're doing something. Well, they were exceedingly debauched over in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, you... you, you I talk about this scenario in my book. I, I kind of, uh, maybe you can call it hyper analyze things. And because <laughs> I like to get down to like the nitty gritty, the everyday practical view, because that's the view that we all come from. That's, that's our lives. Who is this Encarnacion? <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my favorite movies, by the way. Yeah, but mine too. <laughs> when you think about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, we have to pull ourselves out of kind of a Sunday school perception and, and instead let the details, let the story be as raw and as perplexing uh, and as pragmatic as possible. So, so you have Sodom and, or was it Gomorrah? <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, where Lot was in, was Lot in Go, it's Gomorrah or Sodom? I can't remember. Um, his wife, they're basically his wife twin still cities. There somewhere. Uh, I want to say it was Gomorrah. I can't remember. It was one of those two. And you have this, this. So the story goes, to be honest with you, I should probably just read it because it's very, very interesting. And it's only about a paragraph here. Well, it's a very interesting event that, that we're all, we, we're all, we all are familiar with it, but how many of us have actually really thought it through? Well, See, I, it seems like God gets involved when we do DNA experiments, like in the days of Noah and Tower of Babel and, to me, it always feels like when we start tinkering with the DNA, then you see more of the hand of God getting, you know, okay, stop. No, I agree. I think that there's a line that we cross when God intervenes in a big way. And I think tampering with the genetic, the, 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 the genetic book of life uh, is crossing that line. Yeah. And, and it, it demands judgment. It incurs judgment. I wonder if they were doing something like that in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were trying to like, Rehatch. Well, they were exceedingly immoral. I mean, that's part of the Bible says that explicitly. Yeah, but so's so's Vegas. So you know, so many places. So, I mean, sure. What's the difference between a a city of sin and Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, to me, it would, maybe the new the New Testament. Well, I think there's a pretty big difference. And again, if you analyze the story, and I'm trying to find it in my book because um, it's just like a I just it's just like a paragraph, and it would be, I think, enlightening. In my book, I talk about this, 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 the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I find it to be very interesting because, you know, you've got two angels that walk, just walk into a city, and, and, and what happens is, is very perplexing. So I'm seeing if I, need to, if I need to put this in context here before I start, before I read this only paragraph. I'm talking about in my book here, this portion of the, of the book that I'm going to read, I'm talking about the appearance of angels, and I make the case in my book that Angels look very much like us. Indeed, we look like them. And they're, they're, they're almost indistinguishable from us. That's their natural appearance. That's not them taking on some, a form of a human being or just appearing to us like human beings. I think that's what they look like. That's their anatomy. So I don't think they're meta. I don't think that, I don't believe that angels or demons or fallen angels or whatever have the ability to metamorphosize. I do not subscribe to that. So I don't think that an angel can, you know, metamorphosize, or, or let's say a, a, what people call quote unquote fallen angel, which is a contrivance, the word um, that we've invented. The, the word, the term fallen angel is not actually a, a biblical word. It, it's descriptive enough to understand that these are rebel, angelic rebels. Uh, and the reason why I couch it in those terms is because I try, and, I try and pull people away from the idea that angels are just these magical beings with wings whose sole existence is to kind of minister to us or interact with prophets or something like that. I think that's a massive misconception that we have. In fact, in the book, I make the case, the book, by the way, that I keep referencing is called Birthright that I just published uh, about a month ago. In the book, I make the case 
that what we're dealing with when we talk about angels is we're dealing with an, an, an elder race of beings that predate us. It's an older, it's an exceedingly ancient civilization that predates yeah. our civilization. These are not entities with wings or multiple faces or anything like that. They look just like us. In fact, we look like them. They're not human. Uh, they're not made from the substance of the earth like we are, but they are humanoid. It, this is not angels morphing into human beings, metamorphosizing into human beings. It's an important thing to keep in mind, okay? So uh, now I'll read from the book here. The, the biblical narrative seems to insinuate a description of the angels that is consonant with that of the Nordics. Okay, I'm talking about the Nordics. Have you guys heard about the Nordics? Uh, there's an alien race that people talk about. People, ufologists talk about the Nordics. They, they're these human-like aliens that they look like us, but they got blonde hair and blue eyes. And so I'm writing about that before I get to this paragraph. So. We haven't talked about it on the show. Okay, so, so on the eve of Sodom's destruction, Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city when he saw two men approaching. He immediately recognized these men as angels. How could this be unless their appearance was distinct in some way? Okay, just full stop right there. How in the world did Lot, Lot immediately recognize these two men as angels? You know, I'm not reading him. I'm asking you guys. So how, how in the world does Lot recognize these guys as angels? You must have seen angels before, right? I think the answer is apparent, and, and I'll answer in a minute. So continuing here. Sodom was, in Judea, Sodom was in Judea. The men of Judea were ethnically Semitic, meaning they tended to look like the people of the Middle East today. Uh, Relatively short compared to Europeans with tan skin, dark eyes, and black or brown hair. Two tall blondes with blue eyes and luminous white skin would stick out like a sore thumb in Sodom. Uh, the unique and striking appearance of these men is exhibited in the reaction of the Sodomites, who, being raving homosexuals, gathered together at Lot's door, demanding that he bring out his guests so that they could have their way with them. No ordinary Semitic men, no matter how handsome, would have attracted this kind of attention in a city bustling with activity. So the point here is, I think that Lot recognized these men as angels because they were tall, blonde, had bright blue eyes and fair skin. They're probably six and a half feet tall. And Lot, coming from the family line of Abraham, would have been told stories about the angels. And, and certainly the descriptions of these angels would have been included. And, and, and never, never are you going to find a, a living description. When I say living, I mean an encounter with an angel, an actual encounter with an angel, not in a prophetic context. A, a real-time encounter with an angel in which the angel is described as having wings or being like 10 feet tall or something or 15 feet tall. You're never going to find that. You're only going to find actual encounters in the Bible with angels where they look like young men. Young men. Young men. Young men. Well, the genetics of the giants, they have red hair, right? They're white skinned. So if they're half angel, right? Yeah. And, and I think that that's a, that, that, that's that red hair and fierce and, and that really fair skin may be, may be a genetic marker. I don't know. But, but the point is the reason why the whole city of Sodom, all the men were gathered around Lot's door were because they watched two tall white-skinned, blue-eyed, blonde-haired dudes walk down the street to Lot's house. Hmm. And in a city of a bunch of, you know, Semitic people, probably five and a half, five, five, six, maybe average height, dark hair, brown eyes, the vast majority of them, mm -hmm. raving homosexuals. <laughs> what do you think their response is going to be with these two dudes? Yeah. It makes sense, doesn't it? It makes perfect sense that they would, that they would congress around Lot's house and want him to turn these exotic strangers over to them. And so my, my, the, other, the point here is two points. One, the angels really look like that. And that's why they drew that attention. They didn't look like the Semitic people. They look like tall blondes with blue eyes. That's my guess. Maybe they have other colored eyes. But I, I suspect they're probably clear eyes, blue, maybe, maybe like green. I don't know. But the other point, though, is the level of depravity of those sodomite men. 
that they were so depraved, sexually depraved. These were not passive homosexuals. These were, as I say in the book, ravenous homosexuals. These were predatory homosexuals to the point where they had no moral inhibition whatsoever to demand that these strangers be turned over to be sodomized. That is a level of depravity that is, is leaps and bounds above where we are today, beyond where we are today. Uh, we're going to get there. We are going to get there. I don't know when. Eventually, we're going to get there again. But we're not there yet. Believe me, we're not there yet. You think that's enough? That constitutes enough for God to destroy the entire city? You don't think something else is going on? You don't think there's some genetic experiment going on there? I don't see any indication of that in the text. Okay. When the Bible talks about going after strange flesh, it, it could mean two things. It could mean that, that people are copulating. It could mean three things. People are, A, copulating with animals. Okay, mm -hmm. so they're having sex with animals bestiality. Was that occurring in Sodom? I would imagine so. Um, in fact, I, I would almost guarantee that there is rampant bestiality happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. So that would be going after strange flesh. Uh, being homosexual is strange flesh. That, that's also considered strange flesh in the Bible. And then the third strange flesh, which is the rarest, would be the activity of the watchers copulating with women. So women having sex with non-human males. Uh, that's also strange flesh or, or, or the other way around. Um, so see, see, that's, uh, that's where I think you're trying to create the giants again, right? I mean, I suppose that that's, that's possible, but I, I just don't see any indication. Well, strange that, flesh, you made it sound like women and, and angels are trying to procreate. Again well, what I'm saying is that just because they were going after strange flesh, doesn't mean that that is an indication that there was watcher activity happening there. Yeah, in yeah. other words that there was that there was uh watchers copulating with women and trying to create giants or something like that or giants or 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 having sex with giants i think if there were giants involved the bible is unambiguous about giants so i think if there were giants in the city i think there'd be a footnote there in a story um the bible again is, is very unambiguous about giants so so i'm trying um, to remember exactly how we got into the talking about this it's more specific events relating to the giants like, so when do you think the giants are expelled out of the Holy Lands? When do they leave? Where do they go? Why do they end up over here in America and South America? And now, now let me, let, me, let me say this. Could there have been giants in Sodom and Gomorrah? Could, could, could the, this, the offspring of the Watchers been there and, and engaging in this debauchery or, or maybe initiated it? Were they worshiping the giants? That's all possible but but we have to conjecture about that because there's nothing in the text that indicates that directly so is it possible that there was giants there that that would make a lot of sense that that those cities would be obliterated then uh certainly it's possible so i'm not saying it wasn't i'm not saying that, that there weren't i'm just saying that i think there was enough depravity going on with the regular sized men in the city to warrant the destruction the utter obliteration of those cities but that does not eliminate the possibility that there's giants operating in those cities. I don't know. I just feel like the, we would have been told because again, the Bible's unambiguous about giants. So the giants that were in Canaan, when Joshua, Moses and Joshua went into the escaped Pharaoh. And then after the 40 years of wandering made their way to the promised land and began to encounter and do battle with these giants, those giants were installed in that land and had been for a long time. And you have to understand about those populations in Canaan, the Canaanites that the Israelites encountered were, were, were diverse peoples. We're told, you know, the different tribes that were there. They're generally speaking, were all Canaanites. They lived in the land of Canaan. And it seems to me that some of the tribes were like literally tribes of giants. And then other tribes were tribes of normal people with giants interspersed. So it seems that there was interbreeding happening. Because we have like, what, 28 different tribes of giants described in the old testament tribes that may have been giants certainly there were giants there's no question the bible again is very unambig unambiguous when it says there's there were giants in the land there were giants in the land and i don't think that those giants were you know nba sized players maybe some of the tribes were and maybe some of the giants if you're averaging you know five five height which the people probably were at that time maybe five six like i said maybe maxing out at five, seven, you know, if you encounter a six and a half foot tall person, that person's going to look like a giant to you. But, but having said that, I believe that there were 
12, 13, 14, 15, 16 foot giants inhabiting the land beyond NBA players. These are non-human hybrid entities with different capabilities in human beings in terms of their physical strength, their prowess. Who knows? I mean, maybe they were, were, were the giants, were the offspring, the watchers smarter than regular human beings? I don't know. Who knows? I mean, they could have been. Well, some of the Native American stories is they were they could jump over a buffalo, pick it up with one hand, rip a leg off, and eat it all in like one motion. So yeah. some some of those ancient stories make them sound like. Yeah. And super remember, there's athletes. always embellishment in those stories. There's always embellishment. But still, I mean, I think clearly from my own research, I can say just like I said with Bigfoot, definitively, giants existed. And when again, when I say giants, I'm talking 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 foot giants for sure. Beyond 16 foot, I don't know. I, I suspect, but I don't know. But certainly within 12 to 16 feet. Um, they existed. They were real. Uh, and I think to some extent they still exist today. What about the mud fossils where they say that some of these things are, you know, they have these fossil remains of these mountains that look like the face of giants. And, I mean, we talked to Michael Tellinger. I don't know if you've looked at any of his, his stuff. But he's in South Africa, and he's got a lot of, like, the fossil, mud fossil remains of some of these organs and bones. And he, he, he shows them on a lot of his videos that, like, some of these shoulder blades look like the size of car doors. So we're talking 30, 40. I have 40. no idea what he's looking at. I don't know if what he's looking at is organic. I don't know if what he's looking at is uh, dinosaur bones. I haven't looked into the mud fossil thing. It's interesting. Um, I don't know. I don't know much. People always email about the mud fossil stuff. And, and um, were there giants the size of mountains? I don't think so. I, I don't believe that when the Israelites entered the promised land that they encountered 20 foot giants. I don't believe that. I think they encountered 12, probably eight to 12 foot giants uh, were the majority of the, of the giants that they, that they encountered. We can even bump it down to seven foot because that again would have been a giant to these people. So we're talking probably around the 8 to 12 foot range, primarily with every now and again, a, a, a 13, 14, 15 and 16 foot giant in the mix. I haven't personally seen read evidence that there is an abundance of giants above that size. However, in Peru, there certainly are legends. Um, the research that I did about the giants in Peru, um, where they talk about sticking a rapier sword through the eye socket of a giant. Uh, skeleton that they found embedded in the bank of a, of a river, probably a tomb was exposed, the sarcophagus and the giant fell out of it, the body, the corpse fell out of it, the skeletal, skeletal corpse. And they found the, the head, mind you, the head. So they're not looking at like an like a mammoth or something. And, and they stuck the, uh, and they did say that the sarcophagus was there. So it was obviously mammoth didn't bury their dead in sarcophagi. So mm -hmm. the, the conquistadors stuck their rapier swords in through the eye socket and they said that the head was so large that the, the, the tip of the blade barely touched the back of the skull before the hilt um, hit the mm -hmm. eye socket. So, you know, and I mean, rapier swords are different sizes, um, you know, so certainly, you know, a rapier sword, maybe three feet long, but, but that's, what would the body under that skull be? I don't know. Would it be 15 feet tall? Maybe. And that certainly isn't hard for me to believe that there's 15 foot, foot tall giants. In many cases, you, you find descriptions of giants that were three times, two or three times the size of a normal man. Sometimes you find like in Peru, the descriptions of giants being six times the size of a normal man. Um, but I think some of that's embellishment. I think there were certainly giants. They were, they were really big, but six times the size of a normal man sounds like an embellishment to me. So we got to be careful with embellishment. Uh, the, the, Legends are, are, are embellished history most of the time. You're talking about a kernel of history with embellishment. That's how you get a legend. Well, what, what does it matter if it's 30 or 15? Like, really? What are well, you there's a big difference between 30 and 15. I mean, a 30-foot giant is like a, it's like a Disney you know, giant, I mean, a Disney cartoon. It, that, that's a, th there's a, there's a big difference. Um, More philosophically, like how it relates to history, how it relates to the Bible. Well, I mean, a 30-foot giant is a lot more conspicuous. It's a lot harder to hide if you're a 30-foot giant. You would expect to have a lot more accounts all over the earth of 30-foot giants if they're roaming around. I mean, it's like a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, walking around in the woods. 
it, it can't really hide uh and, and you know 30 foot giant it was, it's so it's so conspicuous that you, you would just expect to find more evidence and more stories of, of giants of that size i'm not ruling out the possibility i'm just saying that if there were giants that were that big they would have been rare indeed but i think giants of let's let's say an average of 12 feet tall were probably fairly common based on the legends and the and, and all the mythos concerning giants that i personally encounter all over the place and in some surprising sources also um, aside from the biblical account but let's talk about some of the misconceptions. Let, let's remember, for example, that the ancient cultures, the Greeks, the Romans, and so forth, who w- one thing that they would embellish for sure were their, were their military victories. I think we can all agree on that. Caesar, for example, Julius Caesar was famous for embellishing all of his military victories in his, in the, in, in his own accounts that he wrote with his own hand. The, the Romans, when they would have a great victory, they'd build an ark of triumph. I mean, there's several of them still standing in Rome. So, so the Romans, and then they would reenact those battles in the Colosseum. They'd even flood the Colosseum to reenact uh, naval battles. So the, the, the Romans the would embellish yeah. those battles. They would embellish them, and they would make their enemies seem much more f- ferocious and powerful than they really were. The Inca did this. Everybody did this, right? I mean, it's just, it's just human nature. So if, and I'm using this as one example, so we can maybe dial back our perception of how widespread giants were uh, in the ancient context. If the Romans had encountered giants, let's say the Romans had fought a tribe of giants. Don't you think there would be like an arc of triumph in Rome (laughs) depicting the Romans fighting these giants and paintings and sculpture and sculptures all over the place. Don't you think that the great, Roman poets like Virgil and, and, the, and the great Roman historians would have embellished the hell out of that battle. Uh, or they, <laughs> they've taken it all to the Vatican. We just don't know about it. Well, I doubt it. I mean, I, 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 I doubt it. So I don't believe that giants were as widespread as some people think, but they were certainly a reality. But I think they were far and few between, just like the Kandahar giant that we were talking about. They were, they were furtive because they were hunted. And by the time the Romans came and the, the Greeks and the Romans and that, the classical era, uh, I think giants were all but extinguished from the earth. In fact, I would say that giants were all but extinguished from, from the earth um, uh, early on, shortly, there, shortly after the invasion, uh, shortly after the conquest of Canaan. I think that most of the giants were probably um, consolidated in Canaan and strategically so. This is really hurt. This is really hurting Nate's feelings, Tim. I mean, he, he, he no. loves he loves thinking about thirty foot giants. This is this is hard. This is I can. See. Well, there could have been a thirty foot giant. I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm just saying that if there was, you know, like the like the green giant, uh, you know, like the size of the the, the giant that's on that vegetable package, right. walking around, a bunch of those guys walking around the earth. Uh, I think that it would be it, it, there would be just a lot more chatter. Yeah, no, I. I agree. In in the ancient records and in the and in and among the natives. Now, were there giants striding around the earth? If there were thirty foot giants, I would say that they were probably they existed before the the flood, and and that would account for their evidence being gone, decimated. Um, but but that, those would be antediluvian giants, and certainly I think the antediluvian giants were larger. Well, megafauna. Yeah. Than the than the post diluvian giants, they were larger, just like the megafauna, exactly, just like the other creatures. Everything was bigger. Yeah. Hey, were were human beings bigger back then? I mean, I don't know. Is it possible? I guess some of the reason I get paused to this, and I don't know, and I'm not as definitive to say because, you know, we brought on a guy that curates uh, news articles. He's got an account called Giants of Ancient America, and he's got you know thousands newspaper reports, digging up some of these things all over the world. And it seems like in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds. There's a couple that are like 20, 25 that get dug up and reported about. And it's 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 prevalent enough, and there's enough stories about it. Like there was one in Franklin, Tennessee, in Luke's backyard that they pulled 30 feet down, and they were digging a well, and they found one in the rock strata that was 18, 18, it was 18 feet. Franklin, allegedly. Yeah. Here in America. Uh, 18's not too uncommon. 18's not too uncommon. I've, I've seen 18 up to 20. That's over here in America. So you're thinking – Right. How did it, you know? But I think a lot of that is still embellished. Don't forget that the late 1800s was a very sensational time in terms of print. The newspapers were very sensational. 
and the stories, you know, you're talking Jules Verne and stuff like that. It was very, it was a very sensational time. Um, people were into spiritualism. People were into the occult big time. It was a sensational time. And so, and, and newspapers were just like today, were vying for uh, readers. And so they would purposely sensationalize stories uh, or sometimes run with unverified, unverified stories to, to gain their, uh, a bigger audience, to get more subscribers. Um, you got to add that in the equation always. You always have to add that in the equation. Well, that's how, that's what all my a academic friends tell me, that that's why they don't believe in giants at all. Because Oh, no, but I'm not like your academic friends in that I absolutely believe that <laughs> giants were dug up in yeah. the United States. I don't think there's any question about it. I'm just saying that if, if somebody says they dug up a 20-foot giant, especially if it's a Native American telling me this, I dial it back to like, I, I like subtract eight feet off that sucker. Because people embellish, man, especially the Native Americans that I've talked to. And even in, in, in Peru and in the North American uh, Native Americans embellish. It's just second nature. They, they embellish. Everything is embellished. And so were there giants dug up in the United States? Absolutely, there were, from my perspective. I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, I think, were there cases where dinosaurs and mammoths and giant sloths were confused for giants? I don't have any doubt about that either. I think it's, I think it's all of the above. Were there giants that were 18 feet tall that were dug up? Probably. Were they, ex were they the exception? Most assuredly, they were the exception. The weird ones are the ones with like horns growing out of their heads. Some they found dwarves and some of these things. You have all kinds of yeah, but again, I don't know how much of that is 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 just the sensationalism of the uh, that was running in the papers at the time. Um, or cyclops I, I don't skulls. They found one with just one eye socket. I don't think there's any question that giants were dug up in the mounds and in other places and, and, and secreted away to the Smithsonian. Yeah. I, to me, there's, there's zero question about it. There's even an, admittan, an admittance by, uh, what's his name, Powell, where he admits that, and, and again, this is in my film, this is in this, the, um, the film Holocaust of Giants, I think, the, the third installment of the True Legend series, I think, in which Powell admits that, okay, we're, we are finding, we're finding, basically he admits that, we, okay, giants are being dub, dug up fine. We can't talk about it because we can't talk about uh, these giants until we figure out where they came from, paraphrasing, because Powell was absolutely dedicated to the doctrine of isolationism. And, and so he was, he was concerned that these kind of discoveries were, were blowing holes in his, in his theory, in his doctrine. Which was, which was the most important thing to him, was this doctrine of isolationism. And so Paul had a, a vested interest in covering up the reality of giants, but he wrote about it. He made what, what amounts to an admission that the giants were being discovered, but they, they couldn't be revealed to the public because they didn't fit the narrative that he was pushing at the Smithsonian and the, and the official narrative of the Smithsonian itself, which was isolationism. And so there's no question that in my mind that giants were being discovered. Now, how big were the giants? Did they have horns? Were they cycloptic? I don't know. I, you got to add in that ingredient of sensationalism. You have to, because if you don't, it's part of the puzzle. It's part of the time, and it's you got to add it in. It's just some it, of these are really weird. It's just like little blurbs in new, newspapers. Like it's literally less than a, a lot of them were hoaxes, by the way. Yeah, well, we're, we're verifiable, and even LA will tell you this. Some of them, yeah, yeah, were verifiable hoaxes, and you're going to find a lot of hoaxes. That doesn't negate the real giants that were being uncovered it just means that people realize okay you you and i if we're if we're publishing a paper if and 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 we have an in, in the state over there's another paper being that that's competing with our paper and we want to one up them and get some more viewers running a sensational story about a cycloptic giant or a giant with horns or something like that is going to help us people aren't able to verify our story like we are today able to track down information you know you would literally have to go interview the people who were involved in the story and so forth don't doubt that there was a a financial uh, incentive to sensationalize everything, not just giants, pterodactyls, um, all kinds of things, all kinds of things, other kinds of dinosaurs that were supposedly cited, all kinds of things were, were, were running in the newspapers, the mystery airship phenomenon that was happening at the time. It was a sensational time. And, uh, but that does not, this is where I part with the critics um, who you talk to, th that does not negate the reality that giants were being dug up in the soils of the United States. They were. So it's like you have to have a balanced opinion because a lot of people, they just err on the side of rationalism. They say there's no way that stuff existed. 
We know it doesn't. No, what I'm saying, what I just said is the rational position. If someone says, looks at all the evidence of giants in North America and says, no, that's, they didn't exist. That's an irrational position, especially when you look at the Smithsonian's own findings and, and admissions and, and Powell's statement. It's irrational to conclude that there was nothing to the giants. That's the irrational position. Hmm. That's, that, that's how I think. But it's also irrational to conclude that all the stories were true. Sure. Yeah. That's also rational. So you got to find the truth is in the middle. The truth is in the middle. You have to admit that there's a lot of critics and deniers who are just blind and, and, and refuse to accept the, the, the veracity of, of giants in America, uh, the bones of giants in America. And then there's the other side where people just believe every single news clipping article that they see from the 18th century, from the 19th century, and just take it as gospel truth. Both ends of that spectrum are we need to be careful with. So find, find the truth in the middle. Yes, there were giants in America. Can all the stories be trusted? No, definitely not. Um, the Smithsonian can't be trusted at that time because they're covering things up left and right, not just things that pertain to the to, to giants, by the way, things that, that, that anything that contradicted the, isol the doctrine of isolationism was, was basically yeah. just secreted away. So, so you can't trust the Smithsonian at the time and you can't trust the sensational newspapers. You gotta, you gotta find the, you gotta find the level ground in the middle. So here's my, here's how it feels. You, you've done a lot of work with Steve Quayle. You've done a lot of documentaries on the Giants. What are the top three things that you would say undeniably, like you, besides putting your head on your hands on the skulls and, in Peru, that people don't know about, that other giant authors don't talk about. What is, what are some of the top things? Because we've, we've talked to a lot of people about it. The, the, the top, the top three would be a, the historical accounts. And when I say historical, I'm talking about, let's, let's use Peru as a specific example. The accounts that are in the chronicles of the priests, the Catholic priests who are, who are going around Peru with the visitadores, okay? The visitadores are the official representatives of the Spanish crown who are accompanying the priests in Peru back in the 16th century. And their mission is to extirpate idolatry in Peru to exterminate idolatry. This is their mission, not to find giant bones, not, not do anything else. Their mission is to extirpate idolatry. And then you have the royal inspector accompanying the Catholic priest to make sure that all of the gold and silver and, 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 and the idols, you know, that are made out of these precious metals, that the crown gets its royal fifth because that's what the crown got, a fifth of the treasure. And so these guys, this is their mission. And as they're going through Peru, several of the chroniclers, several of the chroniclers talk about this, that, and some of them were the Catholic priests themselves, where they detail, they would go into a village. There's one case they, in, in which they went into a village and the native people were worshiping something in a cave. And because the first thing that the priests would do would, would be to would interrogate the leaders of the village and find out who, what gods do you worship and where are your idols, right? So they found out that the gods are being worshipped in the cave. And so they had the natives take them to the cave. And when they, and when they got into the cave, uh, this is recorded by his hand. I want to say it was Ariaga. When they got into the cave, they noticed that there was a bunch of, they called them Gentiles, dead Gentiles all over the place, which probably were human sacrifices, right? So they, they found out that what these people were worshiping, what these natives were worshiping, wasn't some wooden idol or some idol made of gold, but was these dead skeletal remains of these giants. So these dead corpses of these giants that were dressed in cumbia, it says. And cumbia was the, was the traditional, like the royal sort of vestments of the natives, right? The, the, the priestly royal vestments of the natives. So they dressed these corpses and these corpses were propped up and they and the people were worshiping them and they said these were their divine ancestors and the giants were described as having deformed craniums which i interpret as elongated skulls and i think there's reasons why i interpret it that way and the chronicler says that they were six times the size of a normal man which i'm going to guess that they were probably anywhere between 16 and 18 feet tall always adding in that embellishment okay always adding in the embellishment and so then the, then the priest describes what they did. And remember, it's not just the priest, it's also the royal inspector who's with the priest, okay? Representative of the Spanish crown. They, he says they took the bodies out of the cave and they burned them in the village.
That is a historical account. That's not fanciful. It's not secondhand. Them hearing about this, they encounter. Why would they write that? Why in the world would they write that? Why would they just invent that? And it's very unlikely that the natives have dressed mammoths up, you know, the mammoth remains or giant sloths in Cumbia. Yeah. These were humanoid beings that they regarded as their ancestors. And they were burned in the village, the bodies. So that to me is very compelling proof. So that's one kind of proof. And there's lots of stories like that, okay? It's not just hearsay. There's really, really compelling historical accounts. And then you have contemporary accounts uh, that you, you can find not so much in the United States anymore, but contemporary accounts like the one we talked about, the Kandahar giant. But also if you go to Sardinia, places like certain other places around the earth where there was, seems to have been a large population of giants in the past, probably the giants that came over from Canaan during the conquest of Canaan by Joshua, the Israelites. And there was a stronghold, I think, of, of these Canaanite giants on the island of Sardinia, probably mm. uh, uh, either it was either established before or after the conquest of Joshua. And you go to Sardinia and you begin to talk to the, 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 the elderly people there, and you're going to hear story after story where they're going to tell you that they were digging, you know, when they were, you know, 15 years old or 18 years old, they were digging in their parents, they were digging a, a, a foundation for, you know, a, a barn or something that, that they were building at their parents' house. And, and they dug up bones, giant bones, and not just ambiguous bones, like a, ty- a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, thigh bone. They dug up hands and feet, and those hands had, had jewel rings on them. And they, they would get excited whenever they would find these remains of giants because they often had, had gold and silver rings and, and necklaces. Yeah. You know, last time I checked, dinosaurs and mammoths and giant sloths <laughs> didn't wear jewelry. They yeah. didn't wear bling. Well, they're saying that about the giants in Michigan. They, they mined more copper near the Lake Michigan. Just it, it would have taken them uh, humans they, they estimate like 500 years to get that much copper out. Well, I they, think the Phoenicians did it, and there were giants among the Phoenicians. Yeah. Um, and That's so, right. and I think that these were also connected to the Phoenicians, these giants in our Sardinia. And so you, these people are, will tell you that they dug up hands with, with you know, giant hands. And they'll show you with their, with their own hands how big they were. And, and they will tell you this with, and, and I'm not just talking one or two people. I mean, it's common. And people who are sometimes digging up whole bodies and, 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 and plowing in their fields so in a big skull. It sounds like you're saying that they were concentrated. The giants, they, were concentrated. they got pushed into areas and they migrated there. And so there's, yes, there's, pla- they were concentrated. there's places in yeah. the world where you, if you go to, they dig up more. There's like thousands of graves. Yes. And, and I believe that the, the post-Diluvian, the, the post-flood giants didn't necessarily migrate on their own around the world. I think that they were seeded all over the world through the Phoenicians because the Phoenicians were the remnant of the Canaanites. And that's, a, that's another, and I've got reasons why I believe that. But, but so here, that's, so I've got the historical evidence, like in Peru, there's an example I gave you in Peru with the, the Chronicles. And then you have the contemporary stories of the people in Sardinia, for example, who, who the elderly people who will tell you that they dug up the bones of giants. And, and, all, and not just the elderly people. There's all kinds of stories. I, again, it's in the films that we did, the True Legends films. There's lots of stories of even more contemporary stuff than, than a couple generations back. Even stuff from just, you know, from the, from the 90s and 80s where people were employed to dig, dig at certain sites. And they're, you know, they were digging up the bodies of giants in, in a systematic way and, and, and so forth. So those are the contemporary stories. You got, the, you got those stories the, the ancient stories and the, contempor- and the contemporary stories. And then the, the third element, aside from the, that his, what I would consider historical content, is you have all the myths and legends. And those myths and legends are ubiquitous all around the earth. And when you combine those three elements together, uh, and by the way, the contemporary stories, when I say contemporary, when I say historical accounts, I would include into that historical accounting the stories that were coming out of the uh, 19th century in the United States. That's part of that historical body of evidence. Again, the contemporary accounts would be like the one we talked about in the beginning with the, with the Kandahar giant. Those, those, those are contemporary accounts. Um, and then you have the myths and legends. The, would the myth and legend be like uh, Gog and Magog and the, the Great Wall of China and stuff like that? Well, the myths and legends would, would be like the, the legends. Myths, I think, are different than legend. I think myths are designed to 
uh, are designed to convey cosmological phenomena. Um, legends are different. Legends are embellishments of stories that were passed down through generations. Hmm. Uh, with kernels of truth. So you're like, Her- like Hercules and... Those, the, those, those, the, the, the stories like the ancient Greeks, they, they had both. They had legends and myths. And again, I think the, 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 the objective of the myth was to, was to encapsulate and preserve cosmological, scientific information. Whereas legends were like stories, tales about um, remarkable events and, and people and which were embellished over time. And... So when you encounter legends about giants, you know, you can say the same thing about lost, lost civilizations, giants. When you encounter these legends and they're ubiquitous all around the earth, you can logically derive there's truth to the stories. And that's, that's of course, the weakest. That's the weakest. Uh, I wouldn't call that proof. I would call that anecdotal uh, evidence of, of giants. The strongest is the historical stuff, the stuff that's not written in the context of legend or myth, but in the context of history, especially when you have photos, like there's photos uh, from the 1800s, legitimate photos of 12, you know, up to, I've seen up to 15 foot tall mummies and, and things like that. Um, some of those photos are definitely hoaxes. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> In fact, one of them that I thought for sure was, was real, I mean, I really did, Elie Marsuli pointed out to me that it was fake. And I didn't know until he had actually done the digging and, and researched it and found out that it was fake. And I hadn't known. Um, so you got to be careful. And even as scrupulous as I, 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 I try to be, do my due diligence whenever I'm, you know, researching or writing or making a film involving these kinds of things, I try to be extremely scrupulous. I, I, I get caught in some of the hoaxes. Everybody does. And so you got to be real careful. Well, there, I mean, we live in a time when it's almost impossible. I mean, like Luke and I were talking about that today at lunch. We went to lunch and saying we live in the wild west of information where literally anything can be true and anything can be false. And it's never been harder. Exactly. Yep. To vet information. I mean, I mean, I think that's giving rise to, you know, podcasts where you're just trying to go directly to the source and hear something. Something true. Yes. And the the Giants thing's difficult because you do have so much stuff surrounding it. I, I, I guess in my mind, I thought maybe you secretly came came across some bones. I've never seen a giant. I've never personally seen the bones of giants. Yeah. I have not. Um, no researcher that I know has. Not, not L.A., not Steve, Tom Horn. None of us have seen the bones of giants. None of us. Now, Steve and I have interviewed people who, who, who claim to have seen the bones of giants in the, under, the Smith, under one of the Smithsonian's, in one of the Smithsonian's underground facilities, but that's anecdotal. That's hearsay. We, we personally, you know, giants, have I ever seen a giant? Have, no. Have I ever seen a Bigfoot? No. Have I ever seen a UFO that was absolutely a UFO and not, you know, a light in the sky, but was actually a piece of hardware verifiable absolutely that yes unequivocally yes but giants and bigfoot no but i've done a lot of research i think at some point in time one of us is going to find something some kind of hard evidence that we will be able to to demonstrate to display that is is hard verifiable proof of the existence of giants because it, there it's out there I'm, i have no doubt about it it's out there and i think that will happen before somebody finds really hard evidence of, of a Bigfoot, like a dead body of a Bigfoot. I, I think it's much more likely you're going to find a, the remains of a giant, take a picture of it or something, or, or, or actually be able to confiscate the bones. Well, the same thing, I've same heard those stories about, you know, the same story you told us about the Kandahar giant. I've heard that about Bigfoot getting shot in the woods and then the helicopter shows up and they throw it under the, over the and tarp. Was that Duke? Yeah. One, who told us that story? Yeah. I think that was Duke who told us that story. I don't, have any, I don't have any doubt that that is happening. Well, and there's also military stories that they're going out and hunting the things, trying to exterminate them on purpose for some reason. But Steve and I were told by this, the, 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 the pilot told us that, that, that in, the, in, in the military, and some other guys actually told me this independently, and, and Steve independently, that, that in the military, in the, in, the, in the black ops of the military, there, there's something that they refer to as core reality. And core reality is, is, is the reality that's beyond everyday mundane reality. It's kind of at the core of what's going on on the planet that most people don't understand. And giants and aliens are two components of core reality, core reality, core reality.
I, uh, again, I have no doubt that the Bigfoot creature is real. I have no doubt that giants not only were roaming the earth, but still are roaming the earth. They're, they're very rare. They're few and far between. I think, and I think the giants that do exist are, are like the Bigfoot. They're in the very remote areas or they're underground. And now, are they interdimensional? I don't know what that means. I've never, I don't, I don't, I can't conceptualize interdimensional. Nobody can. I don't know what that means because most people, when you talk about interdimensional, they mistake, they conflate interdimensional with an, an alternate dimension. Okay. So you have alternate dimension and you have interdimensional. Those two are, are those are two distinct ideas. Uh, something that's in an alternate dimension. It's like Narnia. You know, you walk through the wardrobe and you pop into the land of Narnia. That's an alternate dimension. Yeah. I can conceptualize that, uh, but I don't know what interdimensional means. I, I don't know what that is. And I don't think anybody really does. You know, people say, well, they're phasing in and out of dimensions. It's like, I mean, I don't know what that means. They're phasing in and out of a dimension. I, nobody knows or what they're that just, means. Or they could just be using quantum physics, you know. They could just be, so we think it is dimensions, but it's just part of the way the world works and energy works. I mean, well, I mean, you could, they could be going through some kind of a stargate yeah. or a wormhole. That certainly, I think, was, is, is practical. I think that's certainly within the realms of... It makes much more sense to me. And, and then if you're talking about that, but see what people don't realize, if you're going to say that in, in, in a Bigfoot or a giant is, you know, that they have access to like somehow they can open up a, a gate and go through it. Well, the question is what's on the other side? Are they just going from one part of the earth to the other or are they going to a different planet? We've heard stories about Bigfoot getting picked up by UFOs and going to other planets. Oh, there's certainly a correlation between the Bigfoot and the UFO. I think that the aliens control the Bigfoots to some extent. It's almost like they it's almost like they're like cattle to them and they use them for different things. Uh, I think it's almost like they're a slave force for the for for the grave. <laughs> it's 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 wild. It's wild to think about. Okay, so here here's my final question because I feel like we've given our listeners a lot to chew on. Let's just say you're in a conversation with somebody and you finally convince them, yeah, the giants existed. They were here. What, what's the ultimate point to try to – I mean, I know why I would want to get someone to get there. What's the, what would you say the, – they're saying, so, okay, so what? So why? Why do I need to, well, why do I need to know this and why do, what does it matter? It's sort of why does it matter to know anything? You know? Well, I mean, is it, is it a – I think it's a pinnacle point of understanding the Bible personally. You can't – I don't really think the Old Testament makes any sense without them. Well, um. I think it also destroys Darwinism. I mean, I think that's one of the big things that has to do with with the cover up or the or the the removal of the evidence as as, as it appears to have been. It complicates yeah. Darwin. It complicates the theory of evolution. I don't know that it obliterates it, but it certainly complicates the theory of evolution in some interesting ways. I don't think it would be a death blow. Um, they would just create a new branch, a new evolutionary branch, and, and stick the Bigfoot in it. Uh, yeah. In fact, they might even the discovery of the Bigfoot could actually bolster the theory of evolution. If you think about it, let's say it's a link, right? Yeah, that's what Jeff Meldrum said. He said that a lot of Christians are afraid of Bigfoot because he thought it would help support evolution. They didn't want it to come out. And I thought it was the I thought it was the opposite. I thought not Bigfoot. No, not Bigfoot because Bigfoot would 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 fit into that hominid early hominid type creature that's just still around. You know, we've all seen the pictures of the of the hominid type uh, proto human apish manish creature, right? So, yeah, yeah. so if we if we find one of those things out in the wild, the evolutionists are just going to say, "Look, we still got; they're still around. We just didn't know." And so, there's really no consequence there in terms of it. I don't know that it really helps one side or the other very much. The discovery of the Bigfoot giants, probably the same thing. Uh, um, giants are much more problematic for the atheist because it does it does help to confirm the historicity of the Bible, but not, not, not in any significant way. So what is at the heart of the cover up of giants and like Bigfoot? Yes. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. I can tell you this. There is a cover up. There's no question about that. There is a cover up. I believe the Vatican is involved, certainly in Sardinia. I got no, no doubt about that. Vatican has been involved in the cover up of giants. Yeah. They steal the bones, uh, I've read, over and over. It's like, yes. So, who else is involved and why? What's the motivation? Mm, I don't know. I don't know what the motivation is. Is it just to disprove the Bible? That may be a component of it. That certainly could be a component. I wouldn't doubt that at all. But but it doesn't seem like it can't be the full picture to me. I think the motivation is because it will reveal some things about our planet and about what things that are going on 
um, that they know about, possibly related to technology, possibly re related to secrets re concerning the ancient world that they don't want us to know for some reason or another. But it, it's hard to really pinpoint why would they cover it up. I don't think there's any simple answer. I just know that they are covering it up. They, they are. There's no question about Tim, it. Tim, would you, would you put UFOs in the, same in the same bucket as these two and say that, that, that there's yes. the cover-up? Yes, I mean obviously it exists, but it, but really it absolutely. That th those are again those those are like core core reality, and I think maybe the Bigfoot, the the Sasquatch is the third component of the core reality that they that I was told, giants, uh, Bigfoots, uh, the giants, giants, Sasquatch, and the uh, and and UFOs. I think is what I was told specifically is considered core reality, and are all three of those things related somehow. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Certainly the, the Sasquatch is associated with sometimes with UFO encounters. And it's too easy to say those things are supernatural or those things are interdimensional. That's too easy. That's cheating as far as I'm concerned. It's cheating because, it, because interdimensional and supernatural, those terms have no explanatory power. They're, they don't tell me anything. They don't give me any information. There's nothing concrete. Yeah. There's not, there, you can't take it any further. It's the end of the road. It's supernatural. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. I, I think that's why the Bible's hard to believe, right? Because you do hear a lot of those stories. And in my opinion, you know, we've gotten a lot, so many emails from people that are like, you know, I was losing my faith. I didn't know what to believe. I was kind of going down this relativistic path. But when you talk about the giants, my faith makes sense suddenly. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how many emails we've got about that. And I feel the same way. It's like something about the giants, the, these physical creatures that and big these these weird things. It's like it's like you can pick up some. It's like you can see something in the physical world that validates the weirder parts of the Bible. Well, proof of the flood. I think would be in the same category when you realize that there certainly was a global cataclysm, just like the Bible describes. Um, but, but, but I think what's more eye-opening than uh, realizing that giants did exist, because the, the Bible is not the only ancient document that, that asserts that giants existed. Sure. What's really eye-opening is when you begin to understand the gospel and you see the story of the gospel and you realize who Christ was and you realize who we, who we were supposed to be, who Adam was, and, and, the, and then you see all the prophecies pertaining to Jesus of Nazareth prophesied thousands of years before he shows up on the scene. I mean, things that were prophesied to the day, like when he entered Jerusalem on the donkey and was hailed as, as Hosanna mm. and, the, and, the, and the great king, you know, things that were prophesied to the day. That's when you really, when you really begin to absorb that, that's really the stuff that that to me validates the scriptures more than giants, more than anything else. That's the stuff that, that really will blow your mind when you begin. I'm not saying that you guys do, I'm sure you do, but, but when you, when you begin to realize the story of mankind from the beginning, all the way back to Adam, and then you build around the narrative of the gospel, all these other weird things like giants and the Bigfoot and the, and, the, and, the, and the UFOs and start to add those into the equation, then things get really weird. And, <laughs> and, and you know, and, and that's really an awakening, I think. Maybe it's the violence, because I think for, for a lot of people, it's the violence in the Old Testament doesn't make any sense to people. Yes, that's certainly true. That's certainly a problem for a lot of people. And then when they plug in the, the hybrid component into that equation, it makes sense to them. And because why would God um, condone, indeed, command, uh, mandate the extermination of a whole people group? Yeah. Well, because they were hybrids and because they, were, they had hybrids breeding with them. And the, uh, the, and the objective of the hybrids, the hybrids were hostile to the human race and almost led to the, uh, to the annihilation of the human species before the flood. So when you start mm -hmm. to understand that, you realize if the human species is going to persist in the earth and the Christ is going to come, the, the, the savior of mankind, then, then, then this, then this uh, abominable seed of the watchers must be eradicated and kept in check. Exactly. See, what, and what that does is it makes the whole Bible valid. We have this parts of the church now that are just saying, oh, you can only really trust the New Testament. You know, you have like, uh, what is it, um, Andy Stanley, his son's like, we don't want to believe in the Old Testament anymore. You don't know, any of that, heard any of that stuff. 
Oh, I know that uh, the emergent church and and yeah is 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 not the whole the whole Bible excited makes, about the Old Testament. <laughs> the whole Bible makes sense once you realize that all of it is is it needs to be included and it all works together and it all makes sense. Then it's like, but I think the violence is just a huge part. People go, ah, I can't. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah. I think I think as it pertains specifically to the genocide of the Canaanites. You're absolutely right. Yeah. There's a lot of people who can't get over that. And when you plug in the Nephilim, when you plug in the, the offspring of the Watchers and that whole Genesis 6 Enoch scenario, it, it makes sense. It answers the question of why that happened. And it, and it alleviates people's concerns with what they thought of as a very vindictive, blood, uh, a bloodthirsty god uh, capricious God who just wants to commit genocide and, and, you know, is condoning this terrible massacre. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you put the pieces together, you, you understand why that's happening. And again, that for a lot of people, I've heard that too, that for a lot of people is enough for them to get over that and to say, okay, that makes sense. Now I can accept the rest of the biblical narrative and, and the premise of scripture. Yeah, and I mean, you, you spent two years writing a book about this, and it just showed up at my door, Birthright. I got it. I'm excited to read it. I appreciate you uh, coming on our show Thanks, and uh, dropping yeah. all this stuff. Oh, we could talk forever. I, I know I could talk forever about it. Yeah, it's it's always fun talking about this stuff, and I don't want to pretend like I'm some guy with all these answers. I'm just a guy with a ton of questions, and sometimes questions are funner than answers, and so it's fun to kick these things around, you know, and we've only just cracked the, cracked the, the, the lid on this. You know, you really want to do a deep dive. Giants is one thing. Sasquatch is another, but the alien question I think is the deepest deep dive right now. So maybe we can, maybe we can have a, a alien. Yeah, we'll have to do that. We'll have to do the third round. That's yeah. the blurry creature that's coming. That's for sure. <laughs> and that's what we call the creatures, you know, blurry creatures. Cause we wanted to stay in the creature space and kind of give our show some sort of framework. Cause otherwise you're just a conspiracy theory show. And then it can, you could talk about all kinds of political stuff. And we try to, we try to stick with the creatures. Yeah. It's fun. But I, I was, I think, I think Tim, what, Tim, what you said though, I think is so, is so much like our mantra as well here is that like, we just want to ask the questions. I don't think we ever come to this space or to this platform and, and try to act like we have all the answers. But I think a lot of people don't ask the questions and, and don't go any deeper into, into the meaning, into the, the context, uh, into why and how, and um, just thank you for your time. Cause this, this is, I think more people need to be asking these questions and less people. And, and like you said, I, it's so funny, the 1800s and we, we covered that. And then I think everything's full circle now. Like so much today is, is about the narrative and not about the facts yeah. and people want to push their narrative just like they were trying to sell papers in the 1800s they're trying to get the click the clicks today exactly and i i, th- I don't think anybody's not not enough people are looking for the truth and, and not enough people are asking the questions people want to own the space there's a lot of people out there yeah. who want to own the nephilim space or the want to own you know whatever they they, they 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 want to kind of be the king of the hill and it's it can get pretty complicated um but let me just say you know, to clarify one thing that probably some people are going to walk away getting the wrong impression. When I say I don't like the term supernatural or, or interdimensional, believe me, I, 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 I believe every miracle written about in the scriptures. Absolutely. 100%. I don't, I'm not one of those people who looks at the scriptures and tries to downplay the miraculous things that took place. Um, I absolutely believe, you know, you're talking about Jesus and multiplying the, the loaves and the fish and so forth and all of the prophetic stuff that I, I believe that that is all absolutely true. But, you know, when I talk about uh, the supernatural, supernatural, just like the term fallen angel is a contrivance and it's used too broadly to explain away things that require some, some depth of thought and patience like the things that we talked about today. And too, too often people will say, oh, I, I understand exactly what the, you know, the, the Bigfoot is. It's a supernatural creature. And that's it. That's the explanation. They feel like, you know, that's it. They can close the book. They, they've, they've solved it. Yeah. And that's why, that's what I, that's what I don't like. So, and, and I'm not by any means saying that that's what you, how you guys think. Well, no, no, but I think it's just asking, I mean, it's, again, it's the que- it's questioning, right? Like it's easy to paint a broad brush of, of ambigu- ambiguity in, instead of really asking the question and see how, I mean, I think it fits into the order of the way the, of creation. And so I, I think putting things in those contexts is very important. No, so I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I, 
Yeah, the terms are too ambiguous sometimes and, and too often are are presented as, as solutions to, to questions. Yeah, it it's really cheating. is. It's not good research. It's not a good investigation. I mean, you guys, you guys aren't satisfied with just saying, oh, we figured out what the Bigfoot is. It's just a supernatural creature. It's like, no, you want to find one. <laughs> you want to see one. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. You, want, you want evidence. You want, to, you want to understand exactly what it is and how it, what does it do? Does it reproduce? What does it eat? Where does it live? You know, that's, those are the kind of questions that I think people who have, who just answer supernatural, interdimensional, they, they stop. It's like they hit a wall. Right. And the inquiry stops because they've solved it. And I, I just, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. We're more just saying these are, these are the things you have to include in the conversation. Like, I think the definitive things we would say is Bigfoot's real. Aliens, UFOs are real. You know, giants, ancient giants are real. So then let's let's talk. Let's set up those fences. Right. And speaking of discoveries, Nate just wants to find a 30-foot giant. <laughs> I mean, if, as long as we're being honest. I wouldn't here, want to find a giant of any size living. <laughs> to be honest with you. I think dead. I think it's his, it's his preference. People say that. I don't, I don't know a, a buttload of crap about the gospel, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are right. you listening out there? Tim, I got your book. Uh, it's Birthright. You can get it on Amazon, right? Yeah. It's the only place it's available right now is Amazon.com. And by the way, I do address a lot of of these things that we talked about in the book. So yeah. I, I cover a lot of this ground in, in great detail. Actually, I talk about the Nephilim. I talk about the giants. I talk about the watchers. I talk about the book of Enoch. You know, I talk about aliens. So it's very blurry creatures, uh, friendly territory. Love it. Yeah. So we'll do the part three of the trilogy on aliens to be continued. Oh boy. But uh, yeah. yeah, man. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Have a good evening, guys. You too. Yeah, you too. See you, man. Anytime.